Welcome to the Providence College Podcast. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you like what you hear, please review and share with others. Email podcast at providence.edu with questions or comments. Go Friars! Hello and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Chittam, and I'm joined as always by PC producer and videographer Chris Judge, class of 05. Here at the Providence College Podcast, it's our job to bring you interesting stories from inside the Friar family. And today we are delighted to have Dr. Laura Williams, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Biology. Laura, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. That makes two of us. I'm just going to do a little little bio before we get going. Sure. So you came on uh, came on the scene here at Providence College in spring of 2015. Mm-hmm. Before that, you worked on the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Agricultural Research Service in Athens, Georgia. Uh, you know, Duke, you were at Woods Hole. And before that, and we were talking a little bit before we got started, this is like so fascinating to me and anyone who watches any of these zombie shows. You spent a year and a half at the Center of Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia as an Emerging Infectious Disease Laboratory Training Fellow. So obviously you know all the good stuff behind The Walking Dead. It's true. Which is, which is yeah. not the reason we're going to have you on today, no. but if you want to go in that direction, Laura, yeah. I'm, I'm happy yes. to go there. Time at the CDC. That was very interesting. My students are always interested in hearing about that too. I can imagine. Yeah. I can imagine. But then, then you came up to uh, came up to PC in 2015. What was the biggest draw to come up here? Well, I was really excited. So I went to, you didn't go all the way back through my history, which is totally fine. Um, but I went to a small liberal arts college uh, for my college education, and I really enjoyed it. That was so, Illinois Wesleyan? Mm-hmm, yep, exactly. Yeah, in central Illinois. And I, going through my scientific career, that's kind of always where I saw myself was going to a small school that did both teaching and research. So when I was on the job market, this was a really attractive position for me and I'm really happy here. And I've been, it's funny because I just came up for my third year tenure review. So the process towards getting tenure as a professor in your third year, you kind of check in with your department and they tell you like you're doing this well or think about this and so forth. Um, And for me, it was a good time to reflect on what I've been doing here and just I'm so impressed with the students and I'm really happy with kind of the progress we've been making. So it's been a good home for me. I'm really excited about it. So what was the big draw for you when you were choosing a college in terms of um, deciding whether or not to go to a big research university or kind of the smaller like PC type college? As a student myself? Yeah. Yeah, I really wanted and I did really think about that. Um, hard. And I looked at, I visited, because I'm from Indiana, so I visited Indiana University, which is a very large state school. Um, I visited smaller schools. And I really wanted to be in a situation where I could get to know my professors, um, which is also what we do here at PC. Um, And when you're at a large school, you can get a little bit lost. You know, sometimes you can sit in these giant classes and you just don't have a chance to talk to your professors or you interact a lot more with maybe graduate students. Um, which, you know, that has its benefits too. Uh, but I really wanted to be at, a, at an institution, at a college where I could get to know my professors, and have a chance to learn who they were as people and what they did for their research and what excited them as scientists. And I feel like that's what we do here as well. Um, and so I, I like that I've kind of come around in a circle, basically. Yeah, absolutely. And what's the draw, because what's the biggest benefit of working at a place like the CDC or the U.S. Department of Agriculture versus a college setting? Yeah, sure. And that was really interesting for me when I was in college. And um, this is something we do now in our department. We, um, we try to talk to our students, our majors, about what are the careers that are available to you? Uh, because we get, and this is funny, I tell the story, and I know my mom is going to listen to this, so I'm really sorry to do this to your mom. That, that's one but, listener. <laughs> I've got one. <laughs> it's true. Um, once I tell her about this, she's going to be on board. Um, But when I was thinking about college, what I wanted to major in, I kind of knew from a very early time that I wanted to be a microbiologist. And I really wish I had like an origin story of why, but I really don't. Um, I could just make one up, I guess. But, um, and I was talking to my mom about it and as a high school student, and she was kind of like, well, what what are you gonna do with that? Like, what is, what do you do as a job as a microbiologist? Why don't you just be a pharmacist? You know, because that's the thing I've seen, like I've seen that at CVS or at the hospital, you know. And I think a lot of our students are in a similar situation where um, they kind of have a set of jobs or a set of careers that they know. And they're like doctors or, you know, you can kind of pharmacist, physician's assistant, um, dentist, veterinarian. And some of our students continue on those paths and they 
very rewarding careers. But sometimes you get students coming in who go, oh my gosh, I didn't know you could be a conservation biologist. I didn't know you could get into, you know, in the government. I didn't know you could get into working with the CDC about public health. I thought you had to be a doctor to kind of talk about health. But no, you can go and you can work with the CDC on all kinds of different ways that health inter intersects with society and with people. Um, and I think for me, it was really useful in my career that I've kind of worked at a bunch of different places. So I can kind of help our students then too to say, okay, well, here's what I did when I was at the CDC. Here's what you might think about if you're interested in that. Here's what the USDA does. Uh, when I was in college, I actually did two internships at a pharmaceutical company. So I can say a little bit about industry. So, you know, here's what you do in biotech. Here's what you do if you were kind of trying to develop different um, pharmaceutical products, or maybe you're part of a startup, or maybe you're getting into like genomics where we're having these kits now that you can do at home where you can have them sequence part of your genome and tell you things about your ancestry. Those are companies that require research and development. So they require science majors to kind of come onto their staff. Um, so that's been kind of useful in my background to be able to bring that to our students too. Absolutely, and that's to say nothing of who knows what jobs will be coming up, coming online mm. in 15 years so true. in the sciences. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you know, especially you talk about you mentioned earlier in, in startups, and obviously you have you know, the biotech industry, which is like a whole another yeah. ball of wax. Yes, and they are uh, you know in many fronts developing really interesting ideas, and they need people who you know it's it's uh, as a good example. There's uh, so we teach uh, I teach a non majors microbiology course, and one of the things we talk about, which I think we've you've got some notes on this, is we talk about the microbiome. So the microbiome is your microbial friends, sometimes your microbial foes, but they're microbes that live in and on you. And we know a lot about this now that we didn't know maybe even a decade ago, how important they are for your health and development. And, and people are starting to think about how your microbes impact things like mood um, and so forth. And so in my non-majors class, we talk about this. And we actually had this company Skype in with us. It's called Open Biome. And it's a company in Massachusetts, and they are actually a uh, stool bank. So they are involved in fecal transplants, which you may or may not have heard of. I don't know if either of you I have, run across I have heard of it. You I, have heard of I can't this. say okay. I've experienced it. I yes. have heard of it, though. Right. So we talk about that in the course, how it's a, it's a treatment for um, what's called a C. diff, Clostridium difficile. It's an infection that can happen. It's uh, Most of the time, you kind of acquire it after you've had a really strong course of antibiotics that kind of wipes out your gut microbiome. And then this, this bacterial pathogen, this bug can get in there and cause all kinds of problems. And so one of the ways that you can treat this is you can actually give someone a transplant of a new gut microbiome. The easiest way to harvest the gut microbiome is through poop. And so Open Biome is actually a stool bank where they've screened donors and then they can work with hospitals who want to kind of give this treatment to their patients. And they met with us, um, they Skyped in with our class and the people, we talked about four different people, and they were from all kinds of different backgrounds, and some of them had science backgrounds, and some of them didn't. But one of the things they mentioned was how important it was for their company to have people who kind of had a liberal arts type of background, who were able to think about not just the science, but also the communication, and also the idea of working in teams, and kind of working with hospitals, and working to understand their therapy that they're trying to develop and all of that together I think is is a good way of thinking about especially for our students you know they're getting a lot of science but then they're getting a lot of other skills too and, that, and that's going to come into play like you said with all of these startups and biotech and so forth yeah I can imagine PR and communication for a company mm -hmm. like that would be pretty important yes because <laughs> when you when you come in and you say here's what we're going to do it's going to be a poop transplant so you kind of have to be able to sell that so that people don't just go and ah, you're crazy and i'm leaving that's a great way of putting it so you so you're and in, in the williams lab mm -hmm. you study two different kinds of bacteria you have the predatory and, the, and you have the microbiome which yes. you just mentioned mm -hmm. and you know around a decade ago microbiome went from being you know considered not great for you all of a sudden it's like this integral part yeah maybe like the foundational element yeah. of a lot of what happens in the body, especially a lot of people know about gut biome because in the last 18 to 24 months, it's become such a hit topic with a lot of health, you know, health publications and books and things like that. Absolutely. So why and how did that switch happen a decade ago? 
Yeah, it, it, you're absolutely right. And I mean, it is, if you go back 10 or 15 years, I think the prevailing attitude most people might have had was, you know, bacteria are bad for you, um, which is obviously overly simplistic. Uh, yes, it's definitely true that there are some microbes, bacteria and viruses um, that are going to cause disease. And you, you know, it now is flu time, it's flu season, it's cold season, so everybody is, understands that really well. Um, but what we've started to learn was that that's one side of things, but that we also have a lot of microbial partners that are with us from birth, basically. And they shape our, our gut microbiome, but we also have a skin microbiome, and you know, in your nasal passage, you're colonized with microbes, and those are playing roles in terms of not only, you know, can they outcompete pathogens, but even as you develop in your youth, you know, from the time that you're born until about three years old, your immune system is getting trained and kind of tissue development is, takes cues from microbes. Um, and I think one of the things that let us understand all of this is some of it has to do with genomics. So some of it has to do with the fact that we've, all these tools have opened up for us to be able to actually look at the DNA, um, which simplified things a ton. Because if you're trying to kind of say, we want to study this community of microbes, it's really hard to bring them into the lab and kind of reconstruct them and understand what they're doing. But when we were able to basically take their DNA and look at it as a representation of who's there, that opened up all kinds of, of windows to be, for us to be able to say, oh my gosh, we had no idea that there was this diversity of microbes in your gut or on your skin or in your nose. Um, I think that helped a ton. And you mentioned on your Williams Lab website that, mm -hmm. that bacteria is, quote, the most diverse form of life mm -hmm. on the planet. I know. Which is, I say that to be provocative, too, because then my <laughs> wildlife colleagues are like, excuse me. <laughs> so um, you know, when, you, when you're studying the, the microbiome, whether it's skin, mm -hmm. gut, what have you, kind of what goes into that for the students? Yeah, so we actually had, um, I've had three students who, um, they've all, they all graduated in the same year, um, and they worked with me for about two years on different aspects of microbiome projects. And one of the things that's really great about those three students is they took these projects from the very beginning where we were taking samples and processing samples all the way to the very end where they were working with the, the the DNA data that we had and putting it through complicated computational pipelines and coming up with these great plots of things. And, um, and so they really ran those projects and took ownership of those projects from the beginning. And one of them was uh, a collaboration that we're doing with Steve Mecca, who's in engineering physics systems. And um, you might have talked to him in the past. He and his lab have been working on a project to develop a, a kind of self-contained composting toilet for developing countries. It's amazing. It, it really is. is. Yeah. And he wanted to know like what's going on with the microbes because he's thinking about uh, larger life forms like the earthworms that are in there. But we know that microbes are an important part of that. And so he said, well, I'd kind of like to know what's going on. And so he had a student, Claire Kleinschmidt. Um, Who was a guest on the podcast. Yeah, she was. Yep. Yeah. And um, she worked with me and she kind of started from samples and got all the way through to DNA sequence. And then the other project that we're working on is also a collaboration with a friend of mine, actually, from the University of California, Davis. And she runs, uh, uh, she's in the psychology department. And she has, uh, she's doing research on um, social behavior. And so she works with um, what are called TD monkeys. They're these little monkeys. And they have uh, a colony of TD monkeys that they maintain. And so they can get poop samples for us. And so we're interested in kind of understanding what their gut microbiome is like, and we've got a couple different things we're studying with that. And so two students, Kyle Edmonds and uh, Lauren Procopio, who have both graduated as well, they kind of started that from, from the beginning to the very end. Um, and it's funny because we over the summer, there was one summer when we received a whole bunch of samples, and it, and it kind of, this big box just comes into our mail room, and it just shows up and it sits there. And, and somebody comes to find me and says, you know, you got this giant box, and I think it's got a bunch of dry ice in it. It's, you know, supposed to be unpacked and put away. And I'm like, oh, okay. We're totally expecting that. That's our monkey poop. <laughs> and then one of the students who was working heard that. And for like the rest of the day, I could hear him in different places in the building being like, monkey poop, that's amazing, you know? <laughs> so it's not, it's kind of an unusual, you get unusual deliveries when you're studying the microbiome, for sure. I can imagine. So you got the microbiome, and then you have the predatory. Mm -hmm. Bacteria, which 
was fascinating to me. So I was reading up on what yeah. you guys are doing. Yeah. And it really is interesting when you have, you know, how they basically they attack other bacteria. Yes, is how exactly. It works. And then they have different strategies, different predatory strategies. Mm -hmm. And then I was like shocked that they actually like the wolf pack mm -hmm. strategy. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask, do they can they communicate with each other? They do. Um, so bacteria actually do communicate with each other. They produce chemical signals that can indicate different situations like nutrient starvation or high numbers. Um, and it's it's a simple form of communication. There's certainly nothing as complex as the kind of, you know, the language that we think of when you think of humans communicating. But they do produce chemical signals and kind of uh, within their own population, so within the same group of bacteria, they talk to each other in a way. But then also um, other bacteria who are not part of that group can kind of eavesdrop too. So there's other bacteria that have, have uh, evolved to kind of interpret those signals and then use those as cues. Um, so yeah, there's definitely some some social behavior amongst bacteria. So in that situation, so, so you have the, the eavesdropping mm -hmm. bacteria, so mm -hmm. to speak, and then the wolf pack, mm -hmm. predatory bacteria come after me. Do you actually see like a chase happen? Um, yeah, let's see. I don't know. We don't really see too much of what you'd consider to be a traditional, like if you're thinking about predator prey and you're thinking right. about those great nature documentaries where you're like watching the gazelle run for it and there's like a lion behind them and you're going, oh my God, is it going to make I'm it? I'm thinking you know, like amoeba, yeah. like, yeah. like, like little things like running, like going through like the, the edges of the Petri dish right, trying to escape. Right, trying to like a little Benny Hill thing going on yeah. at the same time. Um, yeah, we don't really see that. And partially for us, um, so we actually, the predatory bacteria that we study don't in fact use the wolf pack strategy. They, they're, um, they use what we call like the aliens strategy, where they basically uh, chase down a prey bacterium. And part of why the chase doesn't really happen the way you might think of it is because these predatory bacteria are ridiculously fast. So when you put them under the microscope, um, I have a video that one of my students took and I've shown it in seminars before, and people are like, they, when they write notes down, they write swarm of angry bees, because that's what it looks like. It just looks like these kind of, just a swarm of angry bees kind of moving around. And so the predatory bacteria that we study, they'll, they'll kind of uh, buzz around and, and swim around, and they'll encounter another bacterial cell. And then what they actually do is they invade it. So they actually end up going inside of the prey bacterial cell and sealing up the prey bacterial cell behind it, and then they digest all of the innards of that prey bacterial cell to make more of itself. And once they're finished with that process, they burst out of the cell and then release their progeny, and the progeny go off and do the same thing. Wow. So it's kind of, I always, when I tell people about it, I'm always like, it's like aliens. I was thinking except, Mr. Smith from The Matrix. Oh, yeah. He sticks yeah. his hand in, and all of a sudden he spreads through and he replicates, sure. and then all of a sudden, yeah. Yep, yep, any kind of good sci-fi thing in there, right. yeah. So what's the benefit to this predatory bacteria in terms of consuming these other bacteria? Is that the only way that they can replicate? Yep, you're absolutely right. So there are some, the ones that we study are what we call obligate predatory bacteria. This is the only strategy they have for getting nutrients, basically. Um, they have to hunt down and, and attack these other bacteria in order to survive and reproduce. Um, that's not true for all predatory bacteria. There are some that are what we call facultative, so that's one of their strategies, but not the only strategy. But the ones we study, they have to do it, or otherwise they're going to starve and die. God, and are these predatory bacteria, are they, these titles might not ring true, but are they, are they good or bad, or both, yeah, or either? Yeah, and, and it's funny because I have a, a, a colleague and a good friend who, who kind of, uh, he makes the argument that there really is no good or bad bacteria. And so the way he gets this across is he has a cartoon that he shows that's like an angel bacterium and a devil bacterium. And he's like, that's not really how it works. Um, so it does depend on context. But um, so for, for us, for human beings, one of the things people always ask me when I say we study predatory bacteria is they'll immediately go, oh my gosh, am I in danger? Like, is it gonna, is it gonna eat me? Like, no, nope, you're fine. Um, to human beings, it, it you know, that doesn't have any effect whatsoever uh, because they don't attack our cells. But for the bacteria that these predators go after, that's very bad news. Um, for us, in terms of thinking about why do we study this, we're kind of interested in it because it has a potential application for treating disease. So we know that with uh, bacterial diseases, one of the things we're very worried about now is antibiotic resistance. And we've seen drug-resistant infections increasing 
um, folks who listen to this might in fact know somebody or themselves have had a drug resistant infection. So there's things like MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and, and other infections that you're getting to the point where in some cases you're running out of antibiotics that you can give somebody that's are, that are effective. That's a scary situation to be in. Um, a lot of public health agencies have identified that as like the major pressing concern for 21st century medicine. And people are starting to think of what are some alternatives to chemical antibiotics that we could think about and develop. And one of them is these predatory bacteria. And that's one of the goals of our lab is to try to see, could you potentially take these predatory bacteria, which we have isolated all of ours from places around Rhode Island. So we've got one from an estuary outside of Bristol. Um, we've gotten some from the bioswale that's here on campus. There's predatory bacteria there. Um, and we've gotten some from the Pleasant Valley Parkway stream that's just, just down the road a little bit. So they're all over the place. Um, and what we're curious about is, can you actually take these predatory bacteria and can you actually develop them into a therapy that you could give a person who has a bacterial infection that can't be treated with antibiotics? Could you find a predatory bacterium that can target that pathogen and, and help that person's immune system clear that out? Um, and I think it's very promising. There's other labs that have done kind of proof of concept studies in animal models, and it, it works. Uh, and so it's a really moving into further into the 21st century as we're tackling this resistance issue. I think that things like this, like predatory bacteria, also bacteriophage, phage therapy, that's a similar idea. I think they're going to become increasingly important in medicine, which that's excites so, the students too. They're like, oh good, an actual application. I'm really happy about that. Absolutely. It's one that anyone can, you know, can, can wrap their head around. You know, mm -hmm. it's very elemental. And at the same time, I would like the first thing that came to mind was like, all right, kind of like introducing this predatory bacteria mm -hmm. into this new environment. And the thought of like, it was almost in my mind, like a parallel between like, all of a sudden you have like a species mm -hmm. in like a wooded area mm -hmm. is being overrun. So you then all of a sudden you introduce wolves and then mm -hmm. just like, you just cross your fingers. You're like, I hope the wolves don't all of a sudden become, you know, too abundant. Right, exactly. Yeah. And that is one of the things you have to think about when you are, when you're working with a living system you're trying to develop a living system as a therapy, you do have to think about, okay, do we, how much would this disrupt? You know, is it going to achieve what we want to achieve by clearing out the infection? But then what would it, what are the potential consequences in terms of disrupting the system? Um, the neat thing about this is that the people who've done animal model work, one of the things they've seen is that our immune system is really good at clearing them out. So our immune system kind of recognizes predatory bacteria as as it would any other foreign bacterium. And so it'll just kind of clear those out once the infection is done. So those kinds of things people are thinking about, and it's, it seems like they're, um, they're not insurmountable obstacles. They're actually things that it seems like we might be able to handle as we're developing this into a potential treatment. Right, so how's your research going in that area? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the first thing we started doing when, he, when, we, uh, when I arrived, because this is an entirely new uh, research track for me, it's, not some, it's something I've been interested in for a long time, but it's not something I actually was working on extensively in my postdoc. It's, I'd, my plan was always to develop it once I'd started the lab. Um, and so the very first thing we did was we had students who, the first batch of students who joined the lab, they actually went out and isolated some predatory bacteria. So that was the very first step, is can we actually get our hands on some of these things? And it's different when you actually read the, when you read the literature that says, they're everywhere, and you go, okay. Like, are they really everywhere? Are we gonna be able to find them? But um, I had four students in particular who started out with me, and they were very successful. Um, and they got their hands on a lot of good isolates. And so we've been characterizing those. We just had a paper, our very first paper, accepted uh, last week. So that's going to be coming out um, for publication, and that was led by um, a class of 2016 student, Brett Enos, oh, wow. um, and he's the first author on that paper. He worked really hard on that. Um, and so we're learning about, um, we're characterizing them, we're trying to kind of understand how they attack different bacteria, what kinds of different bacteria they attack. And then right now, one of the key things we're doing is what's called an experimental evolution project. So we have one of our isolates that was the one that was in fact taken from the bioswale right outside our building. And um, we know that it can attack a bacterium called Pseudomonas. So Pseudomonas is a potential pathogen. 
Um, it's something that people are interested in, in developing therapies for. You can treat it with antibiotics, but if it's resistant, that might be a problem. Um, and so what we're doing in the lab is we're actually taking our predatory bacteria and we're growing it on Pseudomonas, the same Pseudomonas strain, over and over and over and over <laughs> ad nauseum. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to see, will it adapt? Like, will it go from, okay, I can attack all this stuff and I don't really care, to I can specifically go after Pseudomonas and I've evolved in this time that I've been growing on it forever and ever. I've evolved this ability to target it specifically. Um, and that's one of the things we're working on right now is trying to understand, could you potentially take predatory bacteria that you've taken from the environment and get them to kind of target specific pathogens rather than just kind of having a blanket attack on everything? Wow, that is fascinating. My goodness. <laughs> so uh, it's, you're doing all this stuff in your lab. Yes. And by the time this podcast comes out, yes. you're going to be in a new lab. Yes, I am. It's true. Right. Yeah. So the, um, people may or may not know that the science building is, is currently being renovated. Uh, and so we're getting uh, different stages of it are kind of progressing um, over the next couple of years. And one of the current stages is that I'm going to be moving into new lab space on Friday. Um, and one of my students was actually uh, downstairs in the lab today and he wandered over to look at it. He's like, oh, there's so much more space. I'm so excited. Um, so I think it'll be good. We'll kind of have a little more space uh, and people will get to spread out a little bit more, which is good because uh, most of the time I have like Next semester, I'll have eight students in the lab who are working actively on research. And so they like to kind of elbow each other out of the way and get some <laughs> space. So that'll be good for them. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful. And then recently, you've been working on a, a woman in STEM initiative mm -hmm. here in Providence. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. Sure, of course. Yeah. And so that's part of kind of a larger, here at PC, one of the things that we're doing in the STEM departments that we're always thinking about is um, for all of our students, what are the challenges that they're facing? What are the ways that we can help them with professional development? So all the time we're thinking about teaching, you know, we're thinking about helping them acquire knowledge, and develop skills, but we're also trying to focus on what comes next once they graduate. And so we kind of consider that professional development. So we've been trying to kind of uh, develop some events and some um, opportunities for students to think about professional development. Um, and so that's a larger initiative, but within that, we're also thinking about the particular challenges that face uh, women who go into STEM fields. Uh, and, and so we've kind of formed this partnership with um, a group called 500 Women Scientists. And uh, that's a national kind of a national organization that has local pods. And our local group is mostly centered at Brown. And so it's graduate students and postdoctoral scientists at Brown University. And just last Monday, they came over for a dinner with our undergraduate students. So we, we were really excited about this because we're kind of building a bridge between our undergraduate students and kind of early career women scientists who they can talk to about, you know, their uncertainty about career paths or how do they get a good work-life balance or when they're thinking about different careers, what do they factor in in terms of their goals for having a family? Is this particular career going to be help going to allow them to kind of have the family life they want? What are the challenges with that? And it's, uh, you know, as faculty, we're happy to answer those questions, but sometimes it's good to have somebody who's just three or four, or maybe five or six years ahead of you who can say, here's what I thought about and here's what I'm still struggling with. Right. And it's, and it's such a big thing for, for anybody in, in any gender, specifically Absolutely. like, all right, how is my family life going to impact sure. my career? But yeah. obviously from a woman's perspective, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of giving birth and everything that entails, mm -hmm. especially if more than one child, it certainly mm -hmm. can impact, you know, decisions on about, hey, what do I do, you know, the year after I graduate from college? I mean, it really can set the domino effect like right there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think your point is is absolutely valid. Like this is certainly a, um, the work life balance is something that all of our students think about. Um, but I, I know that some of our um, our women students think about, you know, I do want to have a family and, and yeah. there's what's about maternity leave and, and what do I, you know, when is a good time in your career to think about having your kids and so forth. Um, and I think the more people you can get advice from on questions like that and feel comfortable being able to go to people to say, you know, I just wondered your thoughts about this. And so that's part of our goal with the Women in STEM initiative is to give our, our students, our women students, uh, more connections with people who they can say, you know, I've got this question and I'm just going to poll five or six people to see what, the th what they think. So you're getting lots of advice rather than not just, you know, my advice personally. Like, 
I think it's good, but you know, you should get more advice from lots of people. That's a great point. And sometimes those informal relationships can mm-hmm. all of a sudden, you know, veer off into you know other professional opportunities Absolutely. or sounding someone out on a whole different topic, and you never know how those relationships will manifest themselves over time, especially if you you know continue to cultivate them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's good. I'm really happy that there's this opportunity to kind of bring people in from Brown too, um, you know, because that gives them an opportunity to see, if they're thinking about graduate school, that gives them a chance to talk to a graduate student, a current graduate student, and say, what was it like when you applied? You know, how was the GRE? Um, how'd you pick a program? Um, which again, Faculty are always happy to talk at length about our, our thoughts on that, but it's always good to get lots of perspectives on that. That's a great point. And we're talking about a very specific age group here in mm-hmm. terms of women in STEM and you know, mm-hmm. potential issues or things to think about or talk about. But for you, in terms of your opinion about this topic, generally speaking, what are some of the major hurdles impeding women from progressing in STEM fields, both from an academic perspective and then from a career perspective as well? Yeah, you know, and it's interesting because there's a lot of people who this is uh, a topic of their actual, they study this, they study these issues. And and I think that um, there's different elements that people point to. Um, some of it is just kind of atmosphere. Some of it has to do with, you know, from K through 12, like you can start to see early on um, young students getting directed in certain trajectories. Um, for instance, like computer science and, and physics and engineering has uh, representation of women is lower than it is in like biological sciences, for instance. And you can kind of sometimes track that back and see people getting shunted away from computer science. Um, and so some of that has to do with very early on, like what opportunities were you encouraged to pursue? Um, you know, my brother and I were both really into computers, and uh, we both took like some summer school stuff with computers. And I probably could have followed up on it, but it just wasn't something that it was really there wasn't really a push. Um, and I don't think that that was kind of a traditional, quote unquote, scare quotes type thing, traditional thing for girls to think about. And so some of that kind of kind of comes back to just making sure opportunities are available to anybody who's interested. Um, and I'm sure there's some boys that are kind of pushed into different trajectories where they might have had interests that lie elsewhere. So some of that has just has to do with, you know, let's just make sure people have these opportunities to kind of pursue their interests and figure out where do they fit or where do they, you know, in some cases they might want to kind of mesh two fields together and kind of create their own interdisciplinary type of, of pursuit. Um, and I think there's a lot we can do to kind of facilitate that. And do you feel like a lot of the initiatives around this topic are more trying to direct people into STEM or more of kind of remove hurdles for people who are positively predisposed into going into that field or yeah. those fields? Yeah, and you're absolutely right. So some of it is is early on trying to kind of make sure that people are uh, the path to STEM is is not, you know, has doesn't have a bunch of speed bumps. So we're trying to pave off the speed bumps. Um, but then also it is is retention. So when you do get people into a field, what are you doing to try to help retain them? Um, and one of the things we've already discussed has to do with um, family life. So some people kind of look at the pressures of, in particular, the academic life um, and say, boy, I just don't know. I want to have a family and I just don't see how I'm going to juggle these two things. Um, so some of it has to do with family leave policies and just understanding kind of the balance that people have between their professional life and their personal life. Um, and there's a lot of people who are pushing hard on that too. And I think that's, I'm seeing some shifts personally in the way people talk about this. I'm seeing some shifts that I find very encouraging, especially when I'm looking at my students who are coming up. So. I feel comfortable telling them, like, you will find people who will support you when you say you want to have a professional life and a personal life. Right. And it's great for Providence College because, you know, we have biology is a huge major mm-hmm. here at PC in terms of the amount of students that we have. And uh, that's to say nothing of the other majors, which have a lot of people in them as well. Mm-hmm. And then we're building this new science building slash renovation, which is uh, obviously an exciting thing. You're moving in on Friday. Yes. This is finals week. You're taking time out of your day. Thank you so much for joining us, Laura. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Our pleasure. Thank you.